One of the things that separates wrestling from the other sports is that they can write their own stories. In MMA or basketball, for example, you might get a great narrative that plays itself out in front of fans' eyes. But when this does occur, it's usually just happenstance. Inside of the squared circle, however, you get to tell any story you want. Except for the times you don't, because on occasion, these will have to be dropped before they can reach their climax. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. But which were the best example of them all? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into Gone in a Flash, wrestling's biggest abruptly dropped storylines. And considering the point in time this video is coming out, there really is nowhere else we can start this one other than with the sad tale of CM Punk's run with the AEW world title. Yes, what a difference a year makes. As in August of 2021, after having spent eight years away from the industry, the prodigal son would return home to the ring when CM Punk made his debut for All Elite Wrestling on the first dance edition of Rampage. It was a moment many thought they would never see. So emotional was it, in fact, that there were even grown men in the audience weeping at the sight of him. And for the next year following that, those fans would get everything they dreamed of as the voice of the voiceless had classic feuds against the likes of Eddie Kingston, Hangman Page, and MJF. Of course, as time went on, little glimmers of that old CM Punk would begin to present themselves again, such as the time he railed on a fan during the middle of a promo segment for shouting out Colt Cabana's name, or the time he went off script and made Hangman Page look like a fool on national television. And at this point, despite him by then being the AEW World Champion, many began to worry that maybe, just maybe, Phil Brooks hadn't changed as much as he claimed he had. No, maybe there was still that narcissistic side to him left over from his WWE days, one which found it difficult to take any criticism. But while others denied this was the case, they would ultimately be proven wrong when, after he regained the AEW World title from Jon Moxley in the main event of September 4th, 2022's All Out pay-per-view, Punk would get on the mic at the post-show media scrum and trash the company's executive vice presidents, The Elite, and, by association, AEW itself. So after this took place, The Elite, with AEW's head of legal Mega Paresh in tow, would confront Punk in his locker room. And what followed from there would be a brawl which saw everyone involved be suspended, with Punk being stripped of his title as a result. Of course, as of the time of this video's recording, we still don't have all the details of the subsequent investigation which took place, but as it stands right now, it looks like this will mark the end of CM Punk's run with AEW. And that's because, with it seeming like he was largely to blame for instigating the brawl, and with it also coming to light that most of the big names in the company are apparently no longer willing to work with him in the future, there really is no place for him there anymore. Yes, there still is the outside chance Hell freezes over and he returns to WWE, but given the happy state of their locker room at the moment, it seems unlikely. However, it wouldn't be the only time a company had a performer on the roster that had to be stripped of his world title. Though, when it happened to Rob Van Dam in 2006, it wasn't because of a fight. No, it was because of something else entirely. Yes, RVD got caught smoking pot. Who could have foreseen such a thing? Well, WWE as it happens, because despite the ECW Originals pastime being pretty common knowledge at this point, they still decided to have him become the WWE World Champion when he beat John Cena at June 11th's One Night Stand pay-per-view that summer. But then, they'd really booked themselves into a corner with this one, because as one now famous fan sign signified that night, if Big Match John had been able to walk out of the show with the title still around his waist, there was a pretty damn good chance the crowd were going to cause a ruckus. So giving those fans what they wanted then, the company would book RVD to score the pinfall here after a well-timed interference spot from Edge softened up the champ enough for this. And after that, with him now finally being given the ball to run with, all eyes were on Mr. Monday Night as people desperately waited to see if he could live up to the promise he'd always had. Of course, while his in-ring work was never in question at this point, and his position as face of the newly revamped Extreme Championship Wrestling brand was secured when Paul Heyman crowned him the dual WWE and ECW World Champion here too, it would end up being his outside endeavors which brought about his downfall. And that's because, on July 3rd of that year, he and Sabu would be pulled over by cops while traveling to a show, with the authorities at this point discovering a stash of weed and pills in their car, and subsequently arresting both men. And given this was right as Vince McMahon was starting to take his company in a more PG direction, the idea of his champion being busted for drug possessions was something he couldn't have. 
so feeling he had no other option then, he'd suspend RVD and Sabu for 30 days and strip the former of both of his belts, with this marking the last time Van Damme would ever get a sniff of the top prize in the industry. But given this one was partially a result of WWE's hand being forced, we can forgive them for dropping the storyline cold at this point. What we find harder to forgive them for, however, is abruptly ending one which took place years later in 2020, as it was then that, right before the world went into shutdown, the hottest angle on SmackDown was the unlikely love story of Otis and Mandy Rose. Yes, take a schlubby looking guy and a hot girl and put them together, it's a tale as old as time and one pretty much every American sitcom was built on at one point. But how did this one come about exactly? Well, after having professed his interest in her over the weeks prior, Otis would begin helping Mandy win a number of her matches. And while at first she appeared to be disgusted that he was coming anywhere near her, eventually she would get to know the real him and would come to grow fond of his antics. This then led to the two having a date on the Valentine's Day episode of The Blue Brand that year, a date which was going well until Dolph Ziggler got involved and tried his best to steal the girl away from himself. And as the weeks went on from there and Dolph continued to interject himself in the situation, it would be revealed that Rose's real-life best friend Sonya Deville had actually been working with the show off this whole time, with the intention being to split the two up as she felt jealous about all the attention Otis was getting. Ultimately though, this plan would not work, as having completely fallen for the big man by now, Mandy Rose would finally kiss Otis at WrestleMania 36 Night 2, signifying that, from this point on, they were an official item. That said, with the world being in shutdown and there being no fans there to react to the moment, it took much of the shine off of the whole thing. And as the weeks and months went on and Vince McMahon became less enamored with the idea of pushing Otis as a big singles star, he would decide to end the whole love story between the two and move Mandy onto other things instead. But at least it got a big payoff, right? Well, no, because rather than them have an on-screen split, they'd be separated as part of that summer's draft, never to see each other again, and never even getting the chance to say goodbye. That said, at least they can take some solace in the fact that they weren't the only WWE couple around this time to never get a proper on-screen split, and that's because just a few months prior and in December of 2019, Liv Morgan and Lana would have a relationship that was over so quickly, many people forgot it even happened. Of course, it did happen though, as after having been missing from TV for a few months, Liv would return on the December 30th episode of Raw to gatecrash the wedding of Lana and Bobby Lashley. And the reason she was doing this was because, according to her, she and the ravishing Russian had been lovers prior, and she wasn't willing to give the relationship up so easily. But given the fact that this relationship had never been hinted about on TV before, it seemed to come out of nowhere. So with few being interested in the story, it would quickly start fading into the background after just a few weeks. That's not to say Liv and Lana wouldn't feud though. No, with Rusev and Bobby Lashley by their respective sides in fact, they would enter into a series of battles over the following weeks and months. But after that initial period, the idea that the two women in the story had once been lovers would be quietly dropped, never to be referenced again. And that's probably for the best to be honest, as with Vince McMahon still writing the show at this point, it likely would have ended poorly for everyone involved. And speaking of McMahon, he himself was involved in a dropped storyline some years prior to this. However, in the case of McMahon's Million Dollar Mania, it was low fan interest that killed the angle. Of course, we can all hear you asking already, how could the idea of Vince McMahon randomly calling a live fan on Raw every week and giving them a million dollars fail to draw any interest? Well, while it may have seemed like a good way to boost stagnant ratings at the time, the whole thing would be marred by uncharacteristic production's woes from the get-go, with Vince at times looking like an elderly man trying to figure out how to use a phone for the first time. On top of that, the few times he did manage to get through to someone, he would either be met with fans who didn't know the answers to his questions, or voicemails of people who weren't at home. And on one particularly notable occasion, the boss would even get rickrolled on live TV in a moment he almost certainly didn't understand. So with the whole thing quickly turning into a disaster then, and fans tuning out in droves, it was decided that the plug would be pulled at this point. The only question left then was how to best end the story. Well, if you were Vince McMahon, the way to do this was to have him be on stage on the July 20th episode of Raw, ready to give away more money, only for the stage to then collapse and bury him underneath the rubble. Then after this, 
As he was being attended to by doctors, we'd get the hilarious moment of him gruffly calling out to Triple H, Paul, I can't feel my legs! Who was responsible for destroying the stage? We would never find that out in the end, because at this point, the angle would be dropped like a rock and no reference would ever be made to it again. Is it disappointing? Sure. But given how much the whole thing sucked, it's understandable why WWE just wanted to move on from it. But when it comes to our next example, well, that can't be blamed on the company wanting to drop it. No, instead, this one had to be cancelled as one of the performers was leaving. What are we talking about here? The brief feud between Dean Ambrose and Nia Jax, of course. Yes, outside of a few notable examples over the years, WWE has always been hesitant to feature male versus female matches for fear it might look bad to sponsors and general audiences. That said, as time has gone on and more and more people have grown comfortable with the idea of the whole thing, there have been incidences where they've tested the water with this again. And one of the most notable examples would come on the January 28th, 2019 episode of Raw, when Dean Ambrose and Nia Jax ended up having a stare down in the middle of the ring. At the time then, the plan was for this to lead to a match between the two. After all, Jax was one of the most physically imposing women on the roster, and so if it was believable that anyone was going to be able to beat up one of the men, it would be her. In the end though, the initial planned bout between the two at a house show on February 22nd would instead have to be scrapped when the State of Arkansas Regulatory Board refused to let it go ahead. And while there was still a chance another bout could have been booked for a later date at this point, the chance would soon pass everyone by, because with his contract running out and him having no interest in signing a new one, Ambrose would leave WWE two months later. Of course, since then he's gone on to have great success as John Moxley, the ace of AEW and the former IWGP United States Champion over in Japan. So with it looking unlikely he'll ever return to New York again at this point, the chances of this match ever happening are slim. But the same can't be said for another angle which was dropped cold back in 2006, because with Luke Gallows now being back under the WWE banner once more, there's always the chance the company could revisit the fake Kane storyline. What was this one? Well, in the summer of that year, an imposter version of the Big Red Machine would begin appearing on TV, continually confronting the real one in an attempt to prove that he was better than him. And when the two had their one and only singles match at July 26th's Vengeance then, he would actually be vindicated in this as here, the genuine Kane would end up eating the pinfall after just 7 minutes. So with fans left wondering who was powerful enough to beat Glenn Jacobs at his own game, the question began being asked, who is under the mask? But while it would later be revealed that it was in fact Luke Gallows, you would never have known this if you were only watching TV. Now, if you were just doing that, then all you would see is Kane cutting the angle short when, the next night on Raw, he'd attack the imposter during a backstage segment and throw him out of the building, with the whole thing never being referenced again from there, just like so many other angles on this list. Why did this happen? Well, it seems Vince McMahon just didn't really feel like the whole thing was working, and so once again cutting his losses, he'd drop it before fans could get any kind of resolution. Yes, as we've seen a few times now, if the boss didn't like something, it didn't matter if fans were invested or not, because at the end of the day, WWE TV was all about his entertainment. But that only makes our next example of a dropped angle even more surprising than as, with his juvenile humor being well documented, it's amazing he didn't want to go any further with Kurt Hawkins and Tyler Rex's stripper gimmick. How did this one come about? Well, after debuting on the main roster in 2012, the duo of Hawkins and Rex would find themselves struggling to pick up any wins. So after being told by Booker T, then SmackDown general manager, to step it up if they wanted to keep their spot, the two would decide that the best way to do this was by debuting a stripper gimmick in August of that year. Needless to say though, this one did not go anywhere, though the reason wasn't because management weren't into it. No, it was because just one week later, Tyler Rex would request and be granted his release from the company so that he could go spend some more time with his family. And just like that then, the one-week odyssey of the SmackDown strippers was over, with fans forever thereafter being left to wonder how it would have gone if it had been allowed to continue. That said, maybe it was for the best that they never got to see what happened next because when it came to our next entry, even the little fans did get to see of the brand to brand invitational showed that the booking team didn't always know what was best for business. How do we know that? 
Well, in 2020, after receiving repeated criticism from fans about the fact that their own brand extension didn't make sense because wrestlers were just appearing on the other show whenever they felt like it, WWE would try to address the issue with a special rule. And this rule would be the Brand to Brand Invitational, something which allowed various wrestlers to appear on the other show at various times, basically whenever it suited the storyline. Unfortunately though, when WWE tried to explain the rules to the whole thing on their website, it felt so convoluted that few even understood them. And even those who did understand would quickly begin pointing out inconsistencies once they discovered they were regularly being broken on TV after just a few weeks. So with people in power behind the scenes deciding that the whole thing was more trouble than it was worth at this point, the brand to brand Invitational would be unceremoniously dropped, and the idea that some wrestlers could just go visit the other show whenever they wanted to was carried on quietly, even if it didn't make much sense within the fiction of the show. But it wasn't as if this was the only thing on WWE TV around this time that didn't make any logical sense because while the brand extension was trying its best to be logical, hidden away in a dark room somewhere in the bowels of the building, Aleister Black was doling out promises that all his cryptic ramblings would eventually make sense once his dark father was revealed. Yes, with him being in many ways a modern version of The Undertaker, it only made sense that Black would also have a higher power he was serving too one who was quietly pulling the strings from behind the curtain. And this would first become apparent to the audience when, in early 2020, his moody backstage segments began speaking of this mysterious figure. Of course, given how much the company had botched his main event run by that point, many fans of Black were left excited by this as it looked like, finally, he was going to get the big storyline push he deserved, and maybe it would even lead him to the main event scene. And after weeks of teasing then, we would ultimately see him return to the ring, when on the May 21st, 2021 episode of The Blue Brand, the lights would go out and he'd appear in the squared circle, from there laying out Big E and costing him an intercontinental title match. Why had Big E been the target here and what connection did he have with Aleister Black's dark father? Well, sadly, despite this being the big question coming out of that week's SmackDown, fans would never end up getting an answer, because just two weeks later, the Dutch Destroyer would be released from his contract as part of a mass wave of firings. And sure, while he has since gone on to find some success as Malachi Black over in AEW, his WWE fans are still left wondering to this day what exactly would have happened with the Dark Father angle had it continued. But that's not the last example of a dropped storyline we have for you today, because while she now also works for AEW, it was back in the WWE days of Maria Kanellis that her forgotten storyline would occur, and that was the time there was a mystery as to who the father of her child was. Of course, the father was and is her husband Mike Bennett, but while Bennett and Maria were an on-screen couple at the time she fell pregnant in 2019, things would play out differently there as after apparently growing tired of her husband's inability to get the job done and win a match, the newly pregnant Canellis would announce to the world that he was not the father of her baby. So the next question then was, who was the father? Was it someone else on the roster who she had a prior association with? Was it someone from another company they'd both worked in, such as Ring of Honor or New Japan, who was waiting to make their debut? Well, in the end, it would prove to be none of these, at least as far as we know because after weeks of teasing, the whole thing would be dropped when both were released from their contracts in April of 2020. Yes, budget cuts were the culprit behind a lot of dropped angles at this point, but at least with this one, we would later get an answer, albeit not officially on screen. No, instead, we'd have to settle for the word of Maria Kanellis, as she has since claimed that the storyline would have concluded with the discovery that Mike Bennett was the father all along. So there was at least a happy ending planned, if nothing else.